questions you want us to thrash out. Please raise your hand. Let's do it quickly. If you have any questions on what we've done so far, the concept of development itself, the focus on African development from an African perspective, what we think development should mean for the African and how we can attain it at all if it hasn't been attained. Some false categories that we thought had to be clarified. We've done all that. And then we moved on to the notion of conceptual decolonization proposed by RID and what it entailed, the two-fold, if you like, or the two-pronged nature of that proposal of what a conceptual decolonization. <clears throat> Excuse me, we saw that Redu is not only asking for a prompt and urgent reversal of what he considers uh, an uncritical adoption of foreign categories, especially in our concept, to so a quick and urgent reversal of that. But not only that's part of, you know, decolonization, but then also an urgent need to adopt, if you like, and adapt our indigenous cultural traditions that are worthwhile, not a wholesale. Okay, so it's a two pronged, you know, demand on us to make what a conceptual decolonization, a complete one at that. You engage that extensively. And then even further went into a discussion on metaphor and how it shapes an identity of a kind, philosophical identity the prophet emphasized. Okay, we did that. And then we have entered into the frame of another contemporary issue that is relevant, we believe, for the times, religion, morality, if you like, ethics, and science. So we did some engagement of the very important concept of God, the idea of God as an ultimate reality around whom, or depending on your faith, around which religion revolves. We engaged that last week. Can we recall quickly some of the things we discussed about the concept of God, especially evil? I think it was timely, even Turkey, which was then very fresh, our Christian Achu was found, the dead body, that is. And so it was fresh. The problem of evil, the conception of God as all powerful, blah, blah, blah. We engage that extensively, only as a stepping stone to discuss religion and its impact on morality, if you like, or ethics, uh, uh, cons uh, how conscientious we are about politics, culture, you know, normal way of life is all inspired by a certain understanding of the religious that people have. Some may say, no, 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 it's not really necessarily a religious matter. It's a scientific matter. It's a matter of science, how people understand the world. So we are going to engage that today. And a very good overview text is what was shared for you to engage. I believe you've done your homework. If not, we'll end very early. You know, if you have, then we will take from what you have read and then engage you on that. But I'm not going to do the reading for you, like I always say. So I expect that you would have done some good reading and then we will discuss together. OK, so let's first recall some of the discussions we had last week quickly and then we take it from there. And if you are ready to give a response or a reaction on the problem of evil, we also went into the philosophical arguments made for the existence of God after we believed we had uh, addressed the supposed inconsistency or difficulty until then making a case for a God that is powerful, not just powerful, all powerful, all knowing, blah, blah, blah. And yet there was evil. Some thought that if if there is evil, then there, there cannot be an accompanying you know, reality of a God that has all those attributes. Either he doesn't have some of the attributes or that he's not even there at all. The argument that we addressed or we engaged, critiqued and examined was the one that would now lead or claim that there isn't a God just because there's evil. 
present. If he's there, then he's not powerful enough. So we, we recounted some of those arguments. Maybe one or two of you will react and then we can move from there quickly, quickly, please. What did we do? So put some flesh to that quickly and then we can build on that for today's discussion. What did we discuss last week? I want anyone to comment on that. Anybody, please. The problem of evil. We didn't discuss anything, is that it? Um, Felix, is it Felix? Ah, I see Felix, Felix, I never. Go ahead, you were even at the city campus class yesterday, the makeup class on Monday, rather. Go ahead, sir. Let's know what you, you heard. Yeah, uh, Doc, please, can, can I? Can... I can hear you, go ahead. Yeah, so um, we discussed about the uh, why there is evil and the conception of God. How do we make meaning out of that? And uh, our posturing is not just about that. Um, there is the, the presence or the existence of evil and uh, God, but the, the, our, our description on who God is uh, seen as omnipresent um omnibenevolent um mm -hmm. omnipresent yet there is the concept of evil um so we are contemplating it's, it's a matter that uh, we are contemplating as to whether we are not probably describing him well or his if god is the, but looking at the attribute that we give to god it's either it is not so or we are not actually we do not know what uh it takes to be omnipresent or probably most of the things that happens, what we conceive as evil may, may not necessarily be evil. So I, I, that is what I, I remember. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Felix. That's good. Let's hear someone else. What did you engage or what did you pick up from last week's discussion? It was very extensive. I think it was your group that Sabina also did a very good presentation. So I don't understand why. Hey, no, go ahead. Um, hello, madam. Doc. I can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Please, this is um, Prince, Prince Boache. Go ahead. It's fine. You are, you are sharing uh, Gadia Twitter. No. Go ahead. OK. Um, uh, madam, please, you talked about um, um, the problem of God and then the evil. Uh -huh. And you made us understand that um, we are forcing our conception of evil to the all-knowing of God. And another point you made us understand is that um, um, we do not know what it takes for God to be all good because we are not we are not omniscient or all-knowing because of the He knows what is good for us. Therefore, we cannot simply assume that an omniscient or benevolent being would not permit evil. What if that um what if that um, um evil he is permitting is something which is good for us? And then you may that understand that God's um, goodness is not an attribute or a quality because he is the ultimate. So when we talk about God, we are not talking about a quality or an amplifier. Hmm. So please, Madam, please Thank that's you, my lens. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. Now, so that was capturing some of the reactions that we gave to the problem. The problem is there, the problem of evil that has been couched. And then even how some thinkers have reacted. To, and then we also did our own critical examination of it. So what, what then is the problem? I think Felix touches on it a little, but just in case someone is here, he or she is not hearing for the first time, what, what is that problem that we have? Can someone do a good, capture the problem clearly as a build up on what Felix said, then I'll know what, it's not the personal problem of evil that I feel that God has not dealt well with me. And why am I facing all these things? That's the personal one, but the philosophical one that could even lead some to be atheist or to claim that there isn't a being that is ultimately whatever. So I want someone to capture that problem. Let us see, very good. 
um, is it only one person in the class? I'm getting worked up. I'm just controlling myself. Else you go do an assessment and I grade it. <laughs> I don't I don't like it when a class is like that. I'm sure you know already. So let's let's up our our work quickly. You know, let's let's be active. Enoch. Okay, um, Doc, thank you. Okay, so I think that um, from the philosophers that were actually posing the view of God not existing with the kind of argument that we made, I think we appreciated that um, Epicurus um, and then uh, Marky had the same idea, but then Epicurus had an extension. And then the generality of the argument was that we give attribute to God as in being omnibus uh, benevolent, and then that is to be good, and then all powerful. That is means that he is very powerful enough, and then if he's powerful, and then if he's good, then he will want to prevent evil, and then he's knowing, and then because he he's knowing, that means that he knows how to prevent evil, and uh, so they actually give premises. That is how they capture their argument. So omni benevolent means that God is very good. I mean, God is good. And then all powerful means that he has the power to do all things, and then he has the power to prevent evil. And then they come, the, the second thing is that God is all-knowing. It means that he knows how to prevent evil. He knows how to prevent evil. And then they bring out or they argue that anywhere there is goodness or when there is goodness, evil don't have to exist. It's like we having light and darkness. So when we have light, definitely as we see it, when there is darkness or when there is light out, when the light come, the darkness disappears. Okay. So God being in existence, be God being good as they, we it's understand good. that goodness Goodness have to overcome evil, and then they have to make evil disappear. But then when they understand all these things, still, God exists with all these kind of attributes, but still, evil exists in the world, which, which in their perspective or is in their idea is kind of contrary to what they expect from all these attributes that have been given to God and what God has to do. And then in that sense, they conclude that evil exists in the world, and therefore an all-powerful, all-knowing, and a good being does not exist because of the kind of premises that they bring and the, kind, uh, the conclusion that they conclude from. And then from this analysis, we understand that they try to denounce the existence of God because they think that automatically, because all these attributes have been given to God, it has to automatically let evil not exist, uh, but then um, that is not actually what it should be. So that is the problem that was being captured from the philosophers, please. Very good. Thank you very much. Some of them are not even philosophers proper. They are uh, you know, people reflecting on the problem of evil. So it's fine. I see Queenie's hand. Thank you so much, Enoch. Queenie, go ahead. Please, can you hear me? Can you hear clearly, Kenny? Right. Okay. So, um, the discussion last week, we mentioned that the argument that I made is that if God is um, omnibenevolent, then he wants to prevent evil. And if he's um, omnipotent or all-powerful, then he's able to prevent evil. And we say that God is good where goodness is not an attribute, but it's who he is. And so the argument is that if God can prevent evil and he is good, and yet there's evil in the world, it's either that he's not all powerful, as we say, or not benevolent, or that he does not exist at all. Yeah. OK. Thank you so much. So that sums it up nicely. And you will see that I just projected that slide again so that you, everyone can be a bit more coherent and rounded, concise when you are capturing that. It's a simple matter. When I say simple, as, as argued, 
by those who think the problem of evil denies, the fact that there's such evil denies or negates the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, omnipresent God, as, as captured in typically Christian, if you like, or religious settings. A God that knows all things, can do all things, is present everywhere at once, and is good. These are all supposed to be the way religious folks, Christians, Islam, Hare Krishna, Hindu, depending on the versions of uh, religion we have, have some way somehow conceptualized. I can't speak for other faith so much. That's why I'm careful because some would have a certain conception of God that may not be all knowing, all powerful, all good. They might think of only their ultimate creator, the Obuadi, you know, as the one that has this and not like uh, the deities who, who are also God for them. Okay. So I, I like to restrict to where I can speak authoritatively on, but then we can always reference others based on the authority we have. The point is, if you think of that being as all good, all powerful, all knowing, omnipresent, is present everywhere at once, then they cannot reconcile that with, with what? The fact of evil, the presence of evil. And whichever way you want to understand evil, it might be like a child that is born today and born with, I mean, and, and, and a machine falls off the building or he's rolling over playing and they falls off the building and falls down and has lost both eyes, all limbs are broken, has become, you know, what has the child done? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's, that's it, the thinking. How can God watch, God who sees all things, can do all things, uh, what's the other one? He's a good God, etc., etc. Allow such, not a natural, uh, not a, a human, then you say that perhaps the human being didn't listen. Even that, if the human being didn't listen and was going to do something contrary, you are all powerful. That simply means for them, able to do all things, including stopping the, the bad human being from doing that. So even where there is human agency, the query still remains. You are all powerful. So you will see how Epicurus and his friends Capture. These are fine examples. You have to get this very well. Then we can now expand our discussion onto uh, science and religion. Okay. The fact of religion must be grounded somewhat. Why will it still make sense to talk of a, a, a being called God who, who is the center of religion? You see, when that is established, then we can now find the relationship, so to speak, if there is one between religion and science religion and morality. You see, otherwise the religion bit looks like it is, it is not necessary or it's not grounded. So throw it out and let's think about something more relevant. That is why the God factor, which is the center of religious beliefs, faith practices, what have you, must be established somewhat. Okay, we have to interrogate all the questions coming around it and then have a certain sense of what establishment of that one. Then we can now relate religion to some other matter. For our contemporary world okay so look at what someone says why do bad things happen and there are various responses like your your colleagues have mentioned god is testing our faith that's a person of faith hannah sarah abraham in the bible many years god says i'm going to give you a son you will be the father of many nations the man didn't have even one after a while he was tired sarah cried, said hey me this old ladies this is the time they are going to expect that i'll give birth to a child and she laughed as even when the supposed uh, you know, uh, matter was going to come to pass, Mary said, how can I, a virgin who knows no man, give birth? You know, these are all, so someone said, God is testing our faith when things go contrary to what we were expecting. Mary who said, how can this happen to me? Saw her son, it's a Christian faith now, saw her son hung on the cross, nailed, she wept and she felt it. And, and that prophet came to her that, that the sword would pierce through your heart like something. It was already written. Even in the garden, the woman was told what will happen. The enmity that would be between her seed, singular, and the seed of whatever, the, the, the devil. 
prophesying as far back as in the garden, what will happen on the cross. People don't know that. They don't see the connection. Now, these are all faith. So what I'm saying, if you are not a Christian of my faith, you won't even associate with it. So I'm showing you a possible response someone could give, which is not a few people, quite a, a huge number. You know, some say if all the Christians in the world were a little good as they profess, the world would be better because a lot of people profess that place. Faith. So you can't rubbish it easily like that. God is testing our faith, someone will say. That person will say, we could not be as kind or brave if there were no suffering or danger in the world. It's like you're able to uh, you know, na- negotiate and overcome the evil, and that is what makes you better. That's someone's view. So it's like, and if you, the things that happen, they have to train us so that we become better, kinder, more braver. So evil things happen to us to improve us, so to speak. That's someone's view. So what someone says, God is punishing us. COVID is punishment from God for our, you know, profanity and our disrespect for his morals and his uh, precepts and his laws. God brought COVID to come and silence. Even Turkey, it's, it's said undertone because of the, the, the implications. But I tell you, people say that, you know. So people have different reasons. There is no God, says another paper. But it's just happened because that is the way the world is. <laughs> that is it. And these are all versions of why bad things happen. Still connected to our discussion last week, which your friends have uh, done a good job at. Larry, your hand was up. It's gone now, down. And when it comes up again, let me know. Okay, so I'm just showing you what then is evil. There can be the moral one and the natural one. We don't want to worry ourselves over that. But look at that. People think that the existence of evil and suffering in the world shows that there is no good. That's what Queenie built on uh, Enoch and Prince and the others response okay we can go on here but look at how some people react to that the same old story how how can there be a benefactor someone who is powerfully not just powerful though all powerful the epitome of power itself and yet he cannot stop it this is charles darwin darwinian conception. You saw it in the Jechi paper you have read that we are ho- hopefully going to engage. Okay, That's where he's coming from. So the problem of evil can lead to a certain mechanistic interpretation of the world devoid of a God factor. If it is not addressed, the God, whatever you know, antecedent matters, will be shifted aside when people are dealing. If the economist is checking uh, how to manage the you know, uh, overpopulation, even if it means destroying a whole continent, for example, so that we can feed ourselves, there will be no conscience because people would be tempted to do an interpretation of the world devoid of the beyond. And so it is not a trivial matter like uh, it's fate. Well, if someone doesn't want to believe that there is God, you can't have to come in. No, 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 it's not that. It has implications. A whole continent, Africa, for example, can be left empty. If it will fit the narrative that the world needs to survive and these people are not adding much, so they have to be, you know, (laughs) go extinct so that the burden on all kinds of resources will go down. It will happen. So there has to be a certain sense of conscientiousness and, and, and Kant comes from that angle, morality, not morality in the sense we know it. See what Kant argues for. His reason for arguing that there has to be a moral commander whose inscription in our reason inspires us to act the way we act and for which reason we must be regulated. Look at the implication that will have on how the economy is managed, how politics is done how the war between Ukraine and Russia, for example, will be managed or interpreted or addressed if we have a certain sense of the non-physical and religion, mm, religion, a faith matter be related to it. It could also have a dire consequence. Look at the Gaza Strip, Palestine and Israel, or what, what, what not. Has, it, hasn't, it hasn't stopped. So, 
we have to we have to engage that matter. So look at what is attributed to Charles Darwin. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designed parasitic wops. <laughs> I asked you about, I think it was last Monday when I was engaging City Campus. I said, sometimes I don't understand why uh, God created mosquitoes. Especially when after all the spring and the mosquito repellent with all the strong scent on it for my skin, I still feel a bite. <laughs> That's I go, ah, some mosquito dead. I still don't understand why I created them. This man, you see, it, it will look trivial, but look at Darwin makes that case. Of course, perhaps in jest, but he says omnipotent God would have designed parasitic. The, 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 those insects are parasites, warps, with the express intention of feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. <laughs> it realizes the hair. What did God create lies for to come and feed on another? He says, I cannot persuade myself, I can't convince myself that a good and all powerful God would have designed. He's addressing or critiquing the argument from design. And you have seen that already. If you haven't, that's a teleological argument. That's how I teach. So the slides are then connected. We'll see if we will go through that also. Okay. He doesn't think you can convince him that every organized. Let's go back up there. Where is it? So someone read the teleological argument. We'll build on our ontological argument that we did last week and then the cosmological one. Maybe a quick revision will help before we go there. Then we are a bit more organized. What was the teleological argument? Excuse me, the cosmological argument. Will someone try to summarize that for us? Very good. Those were arguments for to show that there has to be a being. Okay. Where is the rest of the class? Is it only one person, two people? Nana Kofiamu, go ahead. Okay, look, uh, so, um, so the concerning the theological argument that is by, um, or is, let me say it's one of the most popular arguments by. Exactly. Uh, yeah, one of the most oh, popular well, arguments. Right. Mm. Okay, so that's the that argument. It says that whatever we see in the um, world, it is by William Pally, and he says that um, whatever we see in the world is. Is made by like a designer, so it's Aquinas. Yeah, it's from, um, Aquinas. It's Aquinas. Okay, right. so from, okay, from Aquinas. Okay, so Aquinas also so, um, argues that whatever we have in the world is probably made by a designer. When we see any, or when we come across any, maybe a, uh, let's say a mechanical device or even um, an artifact, all right, we can um, just reflect on it and have the idea that that's. Um, product or that um, being is is being made by an intelligent designer. So when I'm we sorry. Um, go I'm sorry, I think there's a confusion. Anna, which one okay. are you explaining? Are you explaining the one we've done cosmological, or you are doing the new one that I asked teleological? So that the teleological. You are, if you are doing the, the teleological, teleological, then you were right. Then you were right. Yes. The person you have in mind should be. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, William Pally. So. Um, he he argues from that point of view that whenever someone comes across and he used an example like a mechanical watch that yeah. we can infer from the watch's apparent design and even purposefulness that it must have been made by an intelligent designer. And so when when we see the effects of nature exhibiting or sometimes all these marks of um, purposefulness in their design. Yeah. And then conclude that the world too had an intelligent designer, and this designer this is what we term as God. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well done. I haven't discussed that with you, so that's a well done presentation. Think about the sky. I ask people all the time. What I'm doing is tell us from purpose. I'm arguing from purpose, design. You, you, com in other words, there's complexity. It's complex. There is the thing is organized, it has purpose. See on my screen now. Tell us there is meaning or design, it's an artwork. Look at the sea, it has been boiling. I told your city campus folks, I don't know, last Monday we had a makeup class. I said the sea has been boiling, that's how I say it. It has been boiling since time immemorial, even if it is charcoal fire or gas that was under it and someone was fanning, some angels were fanning, won't it run out? 
<laughs> would you go for refilling of the gas or the charcoal? It has been boiling and boiling and boiling. And I tell you, it hasn't stopped. It's not a trivial thing. Look at the number of human beings on earth, generally speaking. Everybody's teeth arranged in the mouth. Look at a butterfly. You pick a specific butterfly. Even the left side of the wing and the right side may have, you know, these dotted spots. The same curve, if it's oval, oval at the left, oval at the right. This is something like what uh, William Pele is doing. What is he saying? He says, if I look at how intricate, it, this is not necessarily the cosmological one. I wanted us to revise that before. The cosmological one is saying there is a cosmos, there is a world, a universe. If there is a universe, then there must be a cause for the universe, the, a cause, something that caused, they brought it about, so to speak. Okay, because the principal argument is, I'm revising cosmological with you. The principal argument is because everything that happens must have been caused. Now there is a universe. So it's not necessarily talking about the intricate nature or the purpose, the fact that things act with purpose, design, organization, plan. You see, it's not by chance, things are not abrupt. That is the point for the teleological argument. The teleological one is looking at the telos, the purpose, the fact that there, there seems to be a plan behind it. Women get pregnant, they deliver in nine months approximately, okay? Human beings don't have feathers, bears fly, fishes swim. You know, if you put the fish out of water for a while, there seems to be a plan, a setup, a system. The sky doesn't fall down. By your roof, as soon as thunder and lightning start, boom, 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 boom. look at uh, 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 Turkey. Look at the building. You are afraid it's coming down. This big sky, whatever it was made of, has been hanging up there. It knows. Look at the sun and the moon. The, the, there's a time for the sun to rise, the moon to take over. <laughs> it's, it's so organized. This is the argument from Telos from purpose, from design. So I am trying to open them out a bit more for you. The complexity of life on my screen now, please, on earth and the harmonious organization is harmony. Bears lay eggs. Human beings don't lay, their babies are not eggs, of course, there are eggs inside, science has revealed. But when the, the, the human being is ready to bring forth its young, it's a human being, you give birth to. But the lizard lays eggs and leaves it there and goes. <laughs> and then the, the egg hatches. There is a certain complexity. It is not trivial, it's nuanced. This is the focus of the teleological argument. There is some detail, arrangement, organization, design, that's the word, purpose, telos. The complexity of life on earth and the harmonious organization of living organisms exhibits evidence of intelligent design. Take note, intelligence. There is a brain, there is a master builder. Mm -hmm. Those of you who like uh, the, the Christian folks among you, we are the masterpiece. We are the workmanship. <laughs> when I hear that scripture, I know you hear me. A designer has sat down and looked at T.A. Mawuli and has created him like this and put this and that and that. So if it's his iPhone, uh, they say now we have 14 Pro, uh, Pro Max. This one, this design, ah, this is my design, it has this, it can do that, it can do the masterpiece of a powerful brain. That is what you are. You say, some, you say someone say you are what? You don't know uh, contemporary is what? You, you should know it, yes, but I mean, if you don't know contemporary, so you, do you know what the designer put in? <laughs> Maybe all you need is to just do some totals. Bah, bah, bah. Look at this, and I choose that. There are people who have died in Ghana, we don't even know. Nobody's even interested. 17 people do want to sit and buy. 31 or so year old, because of his leg, football, what he does. The whole world, 
BBC is calling somebody because the brain, the one that put something inside the person, prepared him or her in a certain way such that you can tell that there is intelligence. So I just use that to show you so that and then to encourage and then tell you that you can't let someone run you down because you don't have this or that. There's a masterpiece. I said, they say, you are a masterpiece, the p a master, not, not a the work in trial. <laughs> you are the finished product. You just have to find where your purpose is. Now, the person speaking teleology is saying that that is what is so, the fish cannot say that mm, I'm not a bird, so I'm not useful, for example. No, no, no. Let's enter water and see whether the bird can survive there. So if you haven't found your place, then that is when you will see the order, the organization, how intricate and nuanced, how specially designed you are. Now, that was a motivational speech. Bring it now to the discourse. The second point, a design necessitates the presence of a designer. This is a brand. When you are driving, you say, this is a Mercedes. This one says iPhone. This one is Google, whatever, Play Store. This is not a... Okay, I won't call any other brand for trouble, for trouble. See. The brand, the designer, the reason why when you say it is a, whatever, I don't know. So I, let me mention what comes. It's Gucci or Victoria's Secret. The reason why everybody will turn and look at you is because you are addressing the brain, the design behind it. Now look at Gucci and all the brands, you can make CDs, if you go to phones, whatever, all of them are inside this physical world they have been able to intricately design what we see. These people are arguing that. Look at that world within which all these designers are. For them to be able to, not just the physical beings, but the cosmos. I moved from the sea to the sky. I showed you, your, imagine your jaw was hanging on your ear. <laughs> How the world would be scary. Human beings have jaws hanging on their ears or our legs were on our head and our eyes were, I mean, that's the point being made. No, the thing is planned, arranged. So this complex world, even just an iPhone, where we are trying to show you that, hey, all these things inside was designed by so-and-so personal, or so-and-so entity. And we, we applaud and we, we raise such people high up there. How much more the ultimate designer behind this very intricate world. That's the argument that this William Pele prominently makes to say that, look, that's argued that the complexity and efficiency of natural objects, example, the eye, the brain, that is for the physicalists to do. They will tell you how intricate the brain is. We haven't used, according to science, even 2% or say 3% of what the, the brain's capacity. We haven't explored it. Who is behind such a magnitude? You see what the computer does? Can harbor so much information, can produce it immediately. Look at Telegram. That, is, that one is even so amazing, Telegram. I don't know if you know that. I'm not talking current Telegram that is a software. For, no, no, no. I'm talking about you are in Ghana, you type something on your Telegram on a paper and passes through the machine. There's someone is in the US. The paper there receives it. Paper, paper. Hey. The brain behind that thought, <laughs> how intricate it is. Someone else caused that brain. The designer, the ultimate designer, who made you think to create a telegram, a telephone, mobile phone. I'm standing here. They are talking to someone in the US. How aeroplane can lift itself up. I tell that to the critical thinking students or that. I don't want us to just say, oh, is a design, design. You go open it out and let it be real to you. You see that you can't dismiss it. You are thinking about who created the, the Mercedes Benz eh, or the BM, how the tie is this one. And the, these are physical things. The whole world, rocks, rivers, the river knows where it should roll all the way to an end and go back. I said, the sea has been boiling. Uh, the, the man's point is, these are evidence that they must have been purposefully designed. 
so that the fish can give birth to its young and feed us. Then we can give birth to our young and perhaps feed some other group of people. The mosquito will depend on this. The, the, the trees will depend on our oxygen and give us their carbon dioxide. How? Science is discovering. So we are connecting now to science versus religion. So the cheese talk of quantum uh, physics and how it relates to religion and stuff like that, orderliness and what have you. Who told the tree to breathe out oxygen and take in our carbon dioxide? That one has been discovered, uh, discovered by science and we applaud science for that. But can science throw away the unanswered questions? Science is discovering something that is covered. Can science presume that it put it there? We have to interrogate that as philosophers. That's where we are now. Now, if there is that routine, regularity, pattern, that whenever we throw a ball up, it comes down, then there is room for the scientists, empirical scientists, that are to investigate and discover them and detect patterns. And then based on experimentation, find out that, oh, what orange does for my body may be close to what pineapple does, nutrients. So there is a certain systemic research I'm searching to find. In doing that, must it be devoid of religion necessarily, or perhaps they play a complementary role? If you read this, the references I've given, you are seeing how I'm synthesizing the ideas. Perhaps what religion does can be synthesized or they may be two sides of the same coin. What are the day? Religion on one side, science perhaps on the other. And so there are two sides of a common reality perhaps, or there are two ways of speaking about the same reality. One speaking from a physicalist perspective about the same thing. The other one speaking from a non-discovered perspective, perhaps. So we go slowly now. Now, on our, on our screen now, how else could they have come to be as they are perfectly adapted for the purpose they serve? And I told you that this could be what Darwin is reacting to, that me, I cannot think of any good and all-powerful God that will create a parasite warp, an insect that is a parasite. All that it can do to survive, survive, sorry, is to sap or sip <laughs> the blood of another organism till the organism dies. What kind of good, see the emphasis, be beneficent and omnipotent being does that? I cannot bring myself to be persuaded, says that way. There again, you see the problem of evil that we, we recounted moments ago. And here is Pele's argument on our screen. I want one of you to read so that I can also take a breath. Pele uses a watch and its maker to draw an analogy. And I hope you have mentioned that. Just by looking at a watch and all its intricate parts working together in unison, you can tell that it was designed by a watchmaker. Is a hand up? Oh, I'm waiting you now. Put up your hand so I'll, I'll call you to read our brief. So just by examining the complexity of the eye, your eye has an iris, the black part, the white part, the, the inside one. Hey, and when you open how delicate it is, it has something covering it. Then even the one covering, there's a lock called the lid, then the lashes. My people, anyone that will confidently say there is no God, I'm tempted to quote the Bible. That's my reference to say that person is F-O-O-L, and no quotation, my reference, the Bible. Because you may not want to call that entity, whether it's an ultimate cause, the beginning of all things, what have you. But there has to be, even by deduction, and so Jachi's text that you read, the relation between religion and science tells you that there was a, a University of Ghana professor. How many of you saw that? What did the University of Ghana professor say around what I'm discussing now? after his several search about the ultimate reality. I see three hands up. Was it to react to what I've just asked? The university professor, or it was to read for me. I want to see if any of you read it. The university professor said what? After a long study and holding on to, you know, a supposed 
uh, non non religious pushcha to the world, saying that there wasn't any creator beer. Everything started from a boom, small particles, and then survival of the fittest and blah blah blah. Ultimately, what did the man say? Why are the hands only three? I beg you, why are the hands three? Okay, let me hear Bettina. Bettina, you wanted to read for me, I, sus I suspect. If not, and you can react to the professor. Okay, so hold on with the reading. I want someone to tell me what Jechi says in the text. Did you see the professor? Unmute and response. And respond, sorry. Did anyone see Jechi's comment on the, because I want to reference that. Nana Kofi Amu, did you see it, please? Oh dear. You are muted. No, please, dog. Oh, you did. How many of you read the text? Okay, someone's hand is up now. Bettina, did you see it? As I don't say to. Oh. Bettina, I didn't see anything on the professor. Hey, you people. Did you read the text? <laughs> He says, a professor who has practiced for many years and also believed that ultimate, things ultimately started from particles. It doesn't have to start from God, you know, some God creator be anywhere. There are just some particles that, you know, they came together. Some even says everything started from nothingness and then boom, and then all of a sudden creation. And then the one that's Charlie, Charlie. Science is not that arrogant. Science properly done. we we'll see the patterns will discover a lot, discover something that is covered, it uncovers it. But how it comes there, it has to, the, the posturing of the scientific enterprise is to allow for some room for unanswered questions that even if one day we will discover, like life after death could be a scientific matter. Oh yes. <laughs> I think I remember when I was a student, it's more Shrik then says the reason why the question of life after death is a scientific one, not a metaphysical issue. It's because when you die, you will know by observation whether there is life after death or not. So die and see. <laughs> Simple. So it's still a matter of seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, smelling. You just have to die and see. So it's still empirically verifiable. It's not a metaphysical matter. In that sense of it, there is a way that we can think that what? Science and religion are complementary. <laughs> Who is laughing, Kenny? <laughs> that is it. It's very powerful. You can just go and verify that. Okay, back to our slide. I integrated some of the ideas, synthesized them to connect them for you. So the professor says finally that he thinks after these many years, a renowned one, Jetty references him. So I thought you would see when we go to Jetty's text, maybe we'll get to that page. I'm not going to do page one to 25 with you. I'm just going to join the, the ideas across and then show you some highlighted, I have highlighted a few portions of the text to help your reading yeah, in level 400. Okay, so you do that job yourself. But I'll give you some highlight, highlighted point that you must make a note of in at least the discourse on religion and science. As for the one on ethics and religion, it's almost uh, uh, straightforward, sort of. Okay. The Ten Commandments alone can inspire how people are behaving. And God said, the man and the woman should multiply. That alone can make a statement on how to interrogate the uh, current debate on, you know, how do I even put it? Whether there, there is a male and a female, or there's just male, or there's just female, or there is none, nothing, no gender. If we were doing that from Christian or Islamic, or other religious faith, perhaps there wouldn't be a debate after all. Okay, so these these matters. What I'm trying to stress is these matters are not to be relegated to the background, as if they don't matter. Let's talk about things that are more relevant. You are joking. It has direct effect on everything human life, and that is the starting point of the Jechi paper: the relation between science. And religion before even scientific enterprise set up to 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 be to be modern science as we have it people were already asking questions interrogating matters and religion was already there okay 
So that is what uh, Pele, William Pele says. That's a teleological, like I stressed it a bit more and even showed a, a seeming connection with the cosmological one, but still the emphasis for this one is on the design and the purpose. A must have been designed by some sort of divine watchmaker, God. Now, what are the criticisms against that? That is what I'm looking for someone to read for me. So I'll now call, uh, oh, there were three hands. So the lady, please, your hand was up. My lady, was it Benita? Bettina, it was Bettina, yeah. Please go ahead, Bettina, and uh, whoever, whoever is able to read for me, Bettina, see ya. David Hume. It's assumed. Please, if you are holding, if you are using a headpiece, take it off. We'll hear you better. It's assumed without it. justification that there is a significant resemblance between. Please, can you hear me? It's better now, Bettina. Go ahead. It's assumed without justification that. There is a significant resemblance between objects which occur naturally. That, that is the eye and those which have been designed by humans. That is a watch. Is there a strong similarity between the two sufficient to make the analogy strong? Okay, so this person, David Hume, is critiquing whether the idea of making a watch which suggests a designer is the same as the idea of an eye having it. He wants to say this is a false analogy. The comparison don't work. Like you're comparing oranges with pineapples. It's up to you and I to interrogate that. Maybe, maybe it won't work if you ask me because the eye one is more complex than a watch <laughs> and the watch one. But that is one critique. He thinks a false analogy. Please look at the second one. Hume argued that we cannot hear from the fact that examples of order in our universe have human causes. Example, the watch, that the universe as a whole has a cause and, ha and has been designed because the universe is unique. Therefore, this, they, I always have it. The I'm coming now. Okay, you finish. Sorry. Finish. Therefore, because the universe is unique, we cannot rely on analogy to explain it. If you know that the universe is unique, uncle him. <laughs> then why are you trying to find? <laughs> well, you, don't, you don't get me. Or... <laughs> Who is laughing with me? Ah, uncle him, pa. You yourself, you can admit that's what the universe in the democratic there is unique. Unique in what sense? It is not even like designing a Mercedes or a watch. This one is more intricate. I said, look at the sea. Hume himself, his father's 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 father came when he was on earth. The sea was boiling. Billows, boop, 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 to roll and come back and roll for it and come back. There's salt in it. Who has been putting that? Where do they get the salt from to put in? You see, so it should rather the uniqueness, if you ask me, that's my reaction to him. And I'm telling you, when, I, when we are teaching it, all faculty, especially philosophy, you know, philosophy is viewpoint, reflection, examination, evaluation. You don't do philosophy in abstraction, abstract. That means you are purely doing. No, no, there will always be the point of view. So I will try to give them different viewpoints. See how I'm talking about David Hume and critiquing his own. Let me go back. That's what you saw how I was critiquing the supposed view for God. I say you too. Why, why is it you are saying that there is an ultimate cause. When it gets to the ultimate cause, yeah, you don't want to apply your own principle. That everything that happens must have been caused. When we get to the ultimate, the first cause, you see that one there wasn't caused. What kind of uh, partiality is that? You are grading exam. This is your principle. Whoever writes it this way gets it correct. Then you mark for Larry, correct. You mark for Ade Gloria, correct. Amwaku are correct. When you get to Aneba Felix, you say, oh, that one, there, I want to apply another principle. Why? <laughs> so that is my yes, that's a challenge with the cosmological one. Even though it wants to defend the existence of God, which I think is defensible, I think 
I would rather argue for the existence of God than to say there isn't God. I, Nancy. But I can still tell that you can't have different strokes for different folks. If the principle you're working with is this, that everything that happens must have been caused, and that is what is grounding your argument. Why stop at the first cause and that's why you don't want to give? What caused that cause? <laughs> you say, no, 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 that one don't ask. It will lead to infinite regression. Who will kill us if we want to go infinite regression? You see, so, so I'm just saying that every point of view, every discussion we are having will be inspired by a point of view. It is not supposedly by force, you should take it in, but you should see the point of what the person is saying. I, I shift, depending on how I think a view is defensive, I will shift, should I go here a little? Unless I'm not convinced by it, then I can blatantly straightforward it, it's terrible. Okay, so we go back to what we were saying here. I was just trying to show you that you, you, Uncle Hume, if you yourself, you admit that the universe is unique, so you can't do that comparison of a watchmaker being the designer behind the watch with a designer behind the world. Then doesn't that answer the very question you are, you are looking for an answer for? Okay, there is more. Sister, read for me. If the world or universe was designed, who designed the designer? Uh-huh, that one there. <laughs> we all, we start asking our friends who are making a case for the existence of God, including ourselves, those who do. That, well, this one is like the way we critique cosmological argument. If the world was designed by a designer, Yate, who designed the designer? That one hasn't been answered. And as a person of faith, you see, when I get to this place, it humbles me. It doesn't make me arrogant, rather, and start making conclu drawing conclusions and saying, therefore, it is this and not that. Who, who tells you to say that? I, I would rather say that is why we can't say we have ever finished understanding the concept, the idea, the person, the entity, the being. I'm using all because it will depend on who is speaking. Something the the God factor is a concept, an idea. No. I think the God factor is a being, but nobody's concerned about what you think or you don't think. But you can't also stop me from saying what I think. It's philosophy. <laughs> okay. So I'm saying that there has to be a certain recognition that the way scientific study, empirical science for that matter will give you what? Tests, evidence, experimentation. Now, this is from the JT paper, the relation between science. That's the methodology. It can show you samples of metals and show how the metal expanded when it did. It will show you samples of women who have come to the labor world in the ninth month. People that died when their BPs got to so-and-so, heartbeats that stopped, you know, stopped because the BP was so high. Temperature went beyond 39, 40. All these dead bodies here, this one, this one, this one, this one. As soon as they went 46 degrees, they crashed and died. There is evidence, empirical, experimentation, systematic observation. The meteorologist observes consistently and drive, derives a conclusion. You cannot, there comes another point that was in the JT paper. You cannot impose that methodology necessarily on the unanswered questions that faith or religion proposes. So perhaps instead of saying they are conflicting, these two methods of investigation are conflict, that science versus religion are conflicting. Perhaps you might think they are rather what? Complementary or they are in dialogue. You see what I'm doing? I'm referencing something in the JT paper. They are dialoguing, this is the third thesis. They are dialoguing, or perhaps they are rather not dialogue. I was the last one I've talked about. Perhaps they are rather, where are they? I want to look out for the huh? They are conflict. Maybe there's a tension in science and no, perhaps not. Perhaps there's a dialogue rather, a conversation between the two. So the one that this one can, can give, this other one gives. Or better still, perhaps they are an integration. Okay, so it one is an aspect of the other, or better still. They are independent. They are two different, like soul and body. 
So what is applicable to soul is not applicable to body. These are four theses that those who read the paper, just tell me if you read it, raise up your hand. The cheese paper, the one I shared with you, your tea generously worked, helped us and we shared it. How many of you, listen, you read it, you raise your hand. I've set a, an assessment to, or it's like, when we finish, I'll re release it. <laughs> so if you read it a little, they raise your hand, let me see. One person, hey, you are <laughs> three. If you didn't read, I'm going to let you do the assessment. I'm telling you, so, but don't lie that you read. <laughs> hey, you people be careful. I don't want to stress it. This is an elective, but you have to read this level 400. Six people. You will see that the point I've made is there. We'll walk through that slide, uh, that, that text very soon. Just walk through it. The fourth one is what? Integration. So this, these four viewpoints or theses about the relationship, the, how science and uh, religion relates, is coming from Babel. Mm? He says science and religion may interact in four ways. Something they interact in a conflicting way. They don't agree. Everything science says, science says mosquito is the one, and then religion says it's the witch in the village that is causing the poor harvest. <laughs> Otherwise, you, know, you need a lot of nitrogen and something, something. You think religion is only Christian. I just went, some say the Galam say will stop if you tell them that Nana, Atta, whatever, the, the God in that river comes there every evening. The people in Gula, you are busily fighting plenty. You take Galam say, you take guns. So, yes, this guy they killed Major Mahama, bless memory. The Lord keep his soul. Stoned him to death. Because people are aggressively resisting the galam say that is destroying their water body, so to speak. So they think he's one. We all don't know, but we nobody will want that kind of death. Look at the implication. Maybe if people knew that that place, that groove, you don't enter it. If you enter that groove, you go and meet your grandmother, who is the the, the that's religion, that's peace. It has implications on the environment. The next thing, I don't know if we are able to wrap up today, and then we do the last stretch. From next week or we'll add one more for this one this this team and then we finish the next but we'll do something on environment you know de degradation and what have you if faith is when i say faith religion is strengthening the bit you may not even need to tell someone that no that i'm saying they won't go there la. don't you see how the rivers were people don't fear anything again people don't have any reverence for anything again they don't respect as i say our mother no when I say our mother, I'm speaking traditional. I'm not a traditionalist, but I have to wear that coat. That's what I was telling you earlier. Viewpoints. I have to wear that coat and then advance that argument strongly if it is compelling. That's how philosophers argue. Okay? As I see your mother, then you put filth on her like this. You don't clean her, no weeding. Look at the drains. The, the rains are coming. If the people have a certain understanding, Certain faith that Nana Kwame, I told you, we'll do some African you know, tweak to the discussion. That's what I'm doing. God, Obwadi, Obwadi, is so great and so big that to relate with him, we will have to relate with him through symbols, symbolism. So the rock that I can see, I can pour water on, I can show some reverence to. It's just a medium. Suppose that is my faith. The river behind there, I respect the creator too much and his awesomeness that I will not go, and excuse me, ladies, at that time of the month, go and waddle my way through that because I'll mess it up. If I see the Asasiya as my mother, why won't I brush? In other words, Weed, weeding means I'm clearing and cleaning my mother's body. So you see the faith and the religious perspective people have can have implications on what is done economically, what is done politically. But if the people think of all as I want to see before I believe, there should be a systematic connection, et cetera, as a science and technology without barriers, then that is what we have now. People go there knowing that the Galamse people, the, the people checking and I'm saying, will come with guns, they go. 
ready to fight. But all you needed perhaps would have been, if you go there, you have broken a taboo, a faith matter, a religious matter, and it would have been solved by now. Because there are groups that nobody goes in. They call it Nana no Mumpo. That's fancy. Our ancestors, ancestors village, sort of. Nobody goes there to hunt anything. You can go there and find animals that are not common. Don't you know the monkey, whatever? Nobody touches them. You go and say that the president says nobody should die. The next day, people will touch. But if people have a certain sense of reverence, this is the point. Religion, belief, that is dear to them about the non-physical. When you die and you belong to so-and-so in Tro, or so-and-so, uh, uh, what's the name? Belief system. Uh, I want to I want to avoid much of the tree, okay? But in Tro, like um, your mat mat matrilineal line, your totem is so-and-so and, -so and it, 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 crocodile or something. You won't eat crocodile. So then when we come, as tourists to find, we'll find different versions of crocodiles, different, all doing well, and they will not harm us. That's the fate of the people. Okay, that's why I just took you to the Jechi slide. Now, sister, please, you are reading this. So if the world or universe was designed, who designed the designer? That's the question. Please read the second one. The argument of design tells us a little about God, except what God is, except God is a producing being. The argument doesn't allow us to draw any conclusions as to God's nature or character beyond that. The design argument doesn't prove the existence of only one God, as there may be multiple designers. Exactly. So those can be critiques against the Christian version. So when we're speaking, I said, if you go to the other faiths, at least I hear some, and I like to listen. Like the Buddhists, like Hare Krishna, etc., that believe in a multiplicity of gods. Of course, I think they also believe ultimately there is one creator, but they believe that there are deities. Then that query doesn't affect them because they haven't said there is only one being but the christian god at least conceptualized the way some christians do like myself is the one that has to answer that question there, there won't necessarily have to be one there may be many designers like if we went to gucci there may be a group of people kfc brand may maybe may have originated from one person but beefed up and propelled and spread by men okay so look on my screen now darwin also critiques the teleological one. And you will see Darwin prominently in the Gechi paper. His critique of uh, creation, the creation story, which is supposedly the antecedent of all, all you know, beings, all creations. That story, he critiques that with the evolutionary theory. Look at the argument there. I will ask you a question on that. The scientific theory of evolution has done what? Sister, if you are not tired, then read from me. If you are tired, then we get someone else. If you want to read, keep your hand up so that when Bet Bettina is tired, I will call you. Bettina, please do me the answer. Should I read? Or? Please read, my dear. Read. Unless you are tired. If you are tired, then I will let someone else read. Darwin, the scientific theory evolution now provides an explanation of how complex life develops without the need for a designer. By a process of survival of the fittest explains how, adopt, how adaptations to environments have occurred without needing to introduce the notion of God. Really? Was that successfully done? <laughs> Jachi, that's a criticism of that. How many of you saw that in the Jachi paper? The relation of science and religion. He critiques the Darwinian view because, let me see. Did you see it? Very good. Nana Kofi saw that. Or maybe Nana Kofi only wanted to read. Darwin seems to suggest that the first particles must have come from a certain designer. But at the same time, to have, I think I should take you to that slide, or better still. Nana Kofi, did you see it? Tell me what you saw for a map. 
Getty's view. Getty recounts the evolutionary theory as presented by Darwin to critique the existence of God. Uh, yeah. Any, are you ready? Are you able to? Okay, let me, maybe Nana Kofi just wanted to read. Let's finish this and go to the JT paper quickly. So the teleological argument on your screen summarized. How about Kant's moral argument? Nana, please read for me. I think you, you want to read. Nana, please read. You are muted. Yes, please, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Kant's moral argument argue that man must assume the existence of God and life after death if he is to make sense of his desire for happiness and his morality. They also believe that the uniting of man's desire for happiness with man's moral duty could not occur in this life or without God's power. Therefore, it is morally necessary that it's not rationally necessary to assume God's existence. Very good. This is Kant. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> you would think that Kant will come with some analytic, you know, approach. He says that it is morally necessary to assume the existence of God. Not rationally. It's not a matter of using human reason. I do, I refer to those who did uh, rationalism with me last time. I think I've also done that with City Campus. I said, he says, when it comes to martyrs that transcend the experiential frame, what he calls a transcendent uh, uh, nominal world versus the phenomenal world. So the physical world or the experiential world is a phenomenal world. Don't worry much if you didn't do rationalism. I'll just touch on it briefly. How many of you did rationalism? Raise your hand and let me see. I just want to refer to something with it. It will help you understand it. Yes, if you did, just raise your hand. Okay, very good. I have a good number. Keep raising them. If you did rationalism with us, I'm going to talk about transcendental idealism just to show you can't. And then now it's very good. So it's a good number. Thank you, you can, you can lower your hands now. So you see, I'm, I'm showing you can't. If you remember that, you will see why he says, this is not a rational matter. It's not something that is within the frame of what? The phenomenal, the experiential world. The world within which, you know, experience is made possible. A certain frame, the frame, the faculty of experience. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the nominal. He says, if you want to, therefore, it is morally necessary to assume God's existence. And the emphasis is not a matter of rationality, because rationality is within the frame of experience. That's that's Kant. If it's too complex, forget it and tell yourself that Kant says, when we are talking things that are not given to us in space and time, Sana, we should not approach it as if it is like the metal on the table, no. So as for the God factor, we require it to make meaning of what? Our morally necessary being, the way we are. Morality seems to be necessary to us, moral philosophy, categorical imperative. Are you doing it now? Yes <laughs> or no? Please, are you doing moral philosophy now? No, please. I don't know. This level 400. You, you are finished. <laughs> I hope it went well. <laughs> okay. So those, those of you who did moral philosophy, it was a call. Okay. The categorical imp imperative, the principle of universalizability, yeah, universalizability and all that, telling you that it is part of the human reason to do that. That's not what he's saying for this one. This one is a moral, something that is definitive of what? Your morality. So we need, let's put flesh to it. It's rational to be moral. Look at my screen, please. Only if it's rewarded. This Kant, Immanuel Kant, the German thinker. That doesn't happen in this life. What? The reward for what? Morality, rational morality, that is, doesn't happen in this world. It must happen in another life. So there must be an afterlife and a just God. Perhaps that doesn't help you well. When it is formalized this week, watch. Say, read it. Argument one, premise one. Yes, Mr. Dog. The formal moral argument. 
morality consists of a set of commands. That's one. Very good. Two, for every command, there's a commander. Therefore, there's Very a commander good. that commanded morality. Mm. Command only carries as much authority as does their commander. Morality carries ultimate authority. Therefore, the commander that commanded morality carries ultimate authority. Only God carries ultimate authority. Therefore, the commander that commanded morality is God. Therefore, God exists. You know that sometimes the, some of the philosophers, you think about it, I don't know. Ah, why do you stress yourself like this? <laughs> Open the Bible. You see that it is written, God exists. Asa. <laughs> Stop stressing yourself like this. The commander that commands, that has commanded, everything that happened must have a cause, and you are struggling. The fact that you do know everything about the religious, I call God the center of religion, is a good sign. Even the scientific one method of investigation doesn't give us knowledge of everything. We don't know everything, even for the one that is given to us in sensation. We don't know everything. The one that is knowable, no crime. Mm. We don't know everything. Today we thought that the, the geocentric view is correct. After hundreds or thousands of years, it turns out that we were wrong all this while. When Copernicus found out the astronomer eh, found out and is trying to correct, they said no, it can't be because it's going to change fate. You see that in Jechi. Galileo Galilei, <laughs> my friend said. And Copernicus. Religion and faith supposed contention is what I'm addressing now. I'm just synthesizing. Look, even this empirical stuff that is supposedly knowable, experienceable, okay, it's given to us with testing and experimentation and systems. We see patterns and what have you. So we think as for science there, it's verifiable. Even the verifiable science, brothers and sisters in the law, we don't know everything. How many jobs of COVID have people had? <laughs> I haven't had any yet, don't tell anyone. <laughs> I have a design, a, a spiritual vaccine. It's so potent. I need only one job. I'm sorted for life. <laughs> but that is faith. If you don't have that faith, share no one coca will be there. The experiential science, they say nine months a woman will give, give birth to the baby. The child says seven months have coming. Are you going to tell the child to obey the law of science? You have to bring the child out and go and change the law that you thought you had. How many planets do we have in the past? Is that supposed to say science is not useful? It is, but I'm just showing that even science, and we are talking empirical science now, that is supposed to have verifiability as its hallmark, if you like. It doesn't know everything. How much more religion, which is already set off to answer the, the strange, unanswerable questions. Therefore, my point is, the day you finish knowing everything about the center of religion, God, the epitome of religion, God, the day you know everything about what that being is, all knowing, all powerful. It, he answers by fire, whether he's he or she. I say that because I'm not speaking my faith. There are people who say God is a she. Okay, don't worry. We will not pull heads over that for now because it, it doesn't matter much for our discourse. Some say the ultimate being is an it, you, that it. Keep quiet and this. I'm, I'm teaching. The day you start thinking, that you have grabbed everything about the entity called God. He will cease to be God. It has become a scientific, you know, issue. You can investigate scientifically. So then not knowing everything, perhaps should be a sign that you are dealing with what? Uncharted area. Perhaps that is the kind of conversation, I said perhaps, that science and religion must have. Always trying to open it out. And so I told you what I learned in my student days from Shrik. I remember it very well, Maurice Shrik. He says, even the religious matters is still scientific. 
he opens the notion of science so wide, I think, to incorporate what? Even life after death. Is there God? If I say God is, he says it's a matter of verifiability. Perhaps if you die, you will know. Maybe God is too extreme. Life after death. He says, don't think that is non-scientific or metaphysical. So we are throwing it out. Die and see. But we want to know whether there's life after death. If you want to know whether there, there, there is human habitation in the in the moon, what do you do? You go to the moon. So science did all it can to catapult itself, human beings, into the moon and go and put flags up there. Okay. We want to know whether there is life after death. That's life. Kill yourself. Go to the other world. If you go, if you kill yourself and you go and there's life after death, you are verified it. <laughs> if you go and there isn't anything, well, we don't know if you will return. That should give us a certain thinking, perhaps, about what we should think as science. So all these things on your screen now, you see that we have come now to the problem of we saw Kant's moral argument, we saw Pelley's teleological argument. We saw Aquinas's cosmological argument and earlier Descartes and cohorts, they are what ontological argument. They are trying to make a case for the existence of God. Whilst the earlier discussions we had were trying to say there is no God. And the reason why the problem of evil leading to the claim that there is no God is so, if you ask me, so trivial is that if you have a case to settle with God, go and settle it. But don't use the presence of evil to say that therefore God does not exist. Say therefore God is not uh, potent, maybe. But to say therefore God does not exist is so arrogant a posture. And we try to give reasons why. If you attribute all knowingness, all powerfulness, or whatever, all the universals to that entity, then why wouldn't you then regard his being all-knowing enough to know what evil properly is and to know how to deal with evil properly than you who do not know all things? That's the premise of your argument. If God knows all things, why is he not stopping evil? He knows all things, including knowing what evil is, not what you and I inadequate us think evil is. Even if we agree with him and we know what he claims evil is, how to deal with it, he's all knowing. He knows how to deal with evil properly than you and I. We think that if there is evil, it must be the opposite of good. Are we not the ones who said he is all knowing? How is it that now we are giving him the marking scheme when we know that we don't know? <laughs> so let him do it by your own premise. I think that perhaps unless someone else is able to convince me. That issue is dealt with. And so this is where we go to where we saw Charles Darwin's claim that he doesn't see any, he's not persuaded about supposed beneficent and omnipotent God who has designed. It's because I saw this that I took you to the teleological argument immediately. He's critiquing that parasitic wolves whose whole intention is to feed on another living organism. How? How can this be? Like he wants to see which kind of car is this that has been designed that we are going to talk about design and design. Maybe he said the design is bad, but you can't deny Charles Darwin said you can't deny that it's a design. Maybe you just think that this is uh, not a proper design compared to Mercedes. No problem, but it's a design. <laughs> so we have thrown it out. Unless you disagree, then you show me. Then David, look at the name Atemborough says what I think of a parasitic worm. They, 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 this one also goes, so you read the rest for yourself. Supposedly, then the problem of evil, which you so well know now, and I believe you are able to. Then Epicurean paradox, if he's all good, then he can be this. That's what Queenie did for you, summarized nicely as a build up on Enoch and Prince's earlier reaction. Okay. Then John Hick tries to deal with it, and not, not deal with the problem, present the problem differently. He says that. The horrific suffering of for such moral development is inconsistent with the existence of a loving God. Don't come and tell me that we should suffer to become better. Jesus must die on the cross so that we say, ah, look at how someone has to suffer before people will be good. What kind of good God is that? Still on that problem. Why does God allow suffering? These are all accessible to you. Then the debate, some questions for you to reflect on. We see Freud 
the psycho folks amongst you, you know that. Queenie, I'm sure you know Freud by now. Kant, Marx, the political science folks, and maybe some other, you know how Marx deals with religion. I've told you the implications. Things so with religion, there is just some sedative people take so that they forget their problems for a while. But the problem never goes away. <laughs> hey. Is a but in the morning the problem is there. That's how someone is defining religion and faith. So when you are basically saying, I know my, my redeemer live I pray and come and say, Oh, Charlie, this one is just to calm the issues down. God will deliver Ghana's economy. We are going to the four kindness when the person said, Forget it. Go and do the need for this one is matter. That is the implication. Should we also go and stand at the border and pray for the four kindness when people are mismanaging, for example, perhaps not. Do we have to do nine veggies just so that we can get good harvest? Sacrifice nine veggies. That, what, that's what the gods are asking for. In the name of faith, religion. <laughs> Someone burned the Ghana flag, supposed prophet, and, and, and burned a, a goat or something with the, wearing the Ghana flag. Eh? That he, he or she is doing, I don't know. The, the man guy is dead on YouTube. People saw it. That, that's his faith. You know, so see the streams of religion on questioned. You see how I'm speaking now? As if I'm not even a religious person. Yes, because if you be a man, there's a problem at all sides. So you have to be a philosophical mind to integrate the two. Debate on your screen for your reflection, some questions. Do, you, do any of the arguments for the existence of God appeal to you at all, convince you? If none of the argument is convincing, does that mean you can't believe in God? Maybe you can, but not for any of those arguments proposed, perhaps. It's for you to decide that. The science or the scientific enterprise admire the existence of God. You are supposed to reflect on that. That takes us to the end of this slide. Any question, then we'll walk you through the JC paper we've done also, it will just be a matter of giving you some pointers and then we are done for the day. Any questions? Yes, um, sir. Question. Okay, Go ahead, so sir. Um, I, was, I was reading concerning the um, notion of evil and omnipotence and I came across a statement that um, J.L. Markey made that um, those who have a problem with God um, maybe allowing evil to happen, even though he's omnipotent and um, holy, good, it's because they even um, believe that there's a God. So, if you don't believe that God exists, I don't think you have a problem with um, him being holy and omnipotent and yet still allowing evil to happen. And I wanted to just say if that really is convincing. I think it does to an extent, except that some would say that God that they have in mind is there. Someone can say the God in question is the power that be should avoid the evil, no. but it won't hold too much water. So in other words, you are using an internal criticism. You are saying that if you didn't believe God exists, why would you blame him for the evil? Did no. I get no. Yes. <laughs> you must believe that he exists to be able to blame him that he caused the evil. You are blaming him, yet you say he doesn't exist. It is here. <laughs> that, that's the problem. I'm telling them that you said the man knows all things. Why is he not stopping you? Ah, but you said he knows all things. So he alone knows the actual reason why evil, whatever you are calling evil, must not be stopped. It's as simple as that. Go home and sleep because you gave him all. Say that he's not all knowing. Then we are at peace. But you are telling you, if you are all knowing, if you are all power, all powerful, if you are all this, why have you stop this? Ah. But you are telling me he knows all things. So he knows why he hasn't stopped it. You don't. And you don't have to know because you are not him. You have inadequacies. You don't even know how to define good and evil. Oh, but we know evil. As for evil, dear, we know. You know. Are you God? You, you said he knows all. He's everywhere. He's so good. Even goodness. Human beings, this good, good, good. Someone is crying about Atu because Atu was going to pay for his release. Selfish as. <laughs> is that because you are so worried that he went? Ah, who will score our goals for us? <laughs> that is uh, conditional good. 
God is not conditional good by your own description of him. You say he's the very meaning of goodness. You don't understand why there is evil. But who told you that ultimate perfect goodness must necessarily negate evil? What you are calling it. Maybe ultimate perfect goodness is the ability to endure yeah. evil yeah. when you could have stopped it with a snap by you just sit and watch. Like the person is pinching you, expecting you to react. And you are just sitting there smiling at the person. So solemn, so powerful. The person gets irritated the more. You are at a height of, you know, goodness. That doesn't get hurt. It's just watching. Do I want to finish there, you stop. You human being with all your end that basis want to come and show God what it means to be good. What it means to be all powerful when you are not all powerful what it means to know all things. When you human beings don't know, so you can't teach him how he should do it. Let him do it, unless you don't know. So th those were the points. And I think it, it has the same logic like yours. You say he's not alive or he's not, it doesn't exist. Why are you blaming him for the evil? <laughs> it's as simple as that. Okay, mm -hmm. I think I, th I would think deeply about it, but I think I would want to agree to, with you to an extent. Maybe if I think deeply, I may, I may come with a question on that. Thank you so much. Now some top up icing on the cake from the Jechi paper. I've already touched on all the substantive matters. The points I made for you. So you do the whole reading. Now let me see. See one or two things I can touch on for you. Jechi sets off the paper on the relation between this. this uh, oh dear, sorry. That's what I've shared on the screen. From page one, so we'll just walk ourselves to maybe in 10 minutes or so when we are done. We have seen religion, and the religion and morality one, you see it in the other, it's also more Christian in orientation. So I, you see that I didn't dwell much on it because you had already seen the earlier one, the problem of evil itself. So it doesn't look like another evangelism of a kind, but you can read it easily. Look at the, the, the paper, the relationship between science and religion in the 21st century and beyond. The, the beginning of the paper, we can read also, let's, let's just, oh, tells you how religion precedes science. Look, at, look on my screen, I'll be highlighting stuff for you. It precedes, it comes before science, perhaps in, 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 in terms of time, see, precedes science. This is Jechi, so you can always reference him. Because human beings have limited intelligence and a lot of things were bizarre, they will ask questions. So the Christian folks, even before Abraham, there were people, human beings make an attempt to understand the, the mis mysteries, the unexplainables. That's the posturing of religion. Science, perhaps, look at the next line, I'm highlighting that. Like religion and philosophy, course, our, our enterprise. Science began in wonder. Science too is wondering what at all could account for why when we throw a ball up, it will come down. Could there be something in the moon? Someone is gone to the moon. Someone is investigating gravity. Someone says, ah, but why is it that when, when we lift an aeroplane up, it can go. Yet when we throw a ball up, it falls down. The aeroplane is heavier than ball. But one goes up that, okay, then we investigate. So we are always science and searching and researching out of wonder to explore the wonders of nature of the physical world, okay? So you can read all of that. Those are all preliminary comments that she was given to show that it looks like both science and religion have a common subject matter. Perhaps the difference is in how each approaches the question of reality. Look on your screen, please. This is a repeated slide. How each approaches the question of reality. What they think reality is, their interpretation of it, and how they, they, the method they adopt to investigate that. Those are the highlighted portions you see on my screen. Please read the text. I beg, I don't want to stress you, but you have to read. If you don't read, you won't be able to answer my questions. It's not pride. So, so the Jechi paper goes on to tell the relationship between religion and science before the 17th century. There's a lot of historical discussion here showing you that at that time it wasn't too antagonistic. They seem to tie into each other. 
because the people reflecting were not too much, uh, you know, uh, modern science oriented. So it didn't look like there was reason to doubt the matters of faith. But look on the screen now. Despite all this, the highlighted portion, the authority and influence of religion remained largely untouched. Okay, for centuries until this is Jechi's narrative. Look on my screen again. The overall consequence of the interaction between science and religion in the period before the 17th century was a synthesis between them. The two could coincide. We're talking about until, until what? The emergence of modern science on my screen now. So when you are reading, read it that way to help you. You don't have to do. As soon as science modernized, in other words, there's science progressed. Read Karl Popper, I don't know if you've done Popper. Read Kuhn, the paradigm shift in the falsification methodology. As soon as science progressed, that is there's modernity, new ways of doing things. Now I can sit at home and clap and the car will open. I can be in my office and check what is happening at the entrance of my door. That's witchcraft in the past. That was what it would have been. Very soon, people will stand by the wall, tap on it, and they will, they will travel. <laughs> Science is progressing. Now, if that is happening, uh, we're told that I used to do that. I was a, is a, a, a past, uh, apparently now converted, forgive me, I'm Robert then. They said if we were going to catch him then, that's, those were some of the stories around him. He would just uh, lean against the wall and he disappears. <laughs> People thought that is black power. Well, it could be science, unexplained, uninvestigated. That perhaps with time we would have been able to do. So when science modernized, the symbiotic relationship between the two, that's religion and science, started facing what? Hostility and conflict. And so you see that, oh dear, this paragraph or this, if you like, this section engages that. Whereas science is was or became focused on what experimentation, scientific methodology, I've mentioned that over and over and over again. Religion became more and more dogmatic. So when Galileo and his later on Copernicus discovered that there's something wrong with this thinking that the earth is the center of God's creation. So it's the center of the whole planetary, you know, uh, <clears throat> Whatever and that the earth was in, <laughs> bring me water. The earth was in the center of the of the world, the universe. <clears throat> Ptolemy and his folks what, didn't want to accept that. The church rejected that. Galileo was put under house arrest. Look on my screen. Those who don't like reading, I'm showing you so that it is easier for you to read and navigate. Okay. Science now was facing persecution of a kind. Okay, now Jechi's question, he's quoting someone to say, could it be that this shouldn't have been the case because perhaps science and religion were both looking at reality from a different perspective and therefore, look on my screen highlighted, needed to what be integrated. Perhaps they are different independent approaches to investigating reality. Remember the four methods I showed you, the four theses that touch on the relationship between science and religion. One says the two are independent. So you shouldn't force one to be like the other. And they say, no, 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 they are conflicting. Not that they are independent, they can cohabit, but everybody should stay in their lane, no. They will clash as a conflict conflicting view. Others think, no, 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 they are not conflicting. They are complementary. So they are in a conversation. It's a dialogue, the third one. Okay. That is what is happening in, this, in the subsequent paragraphs. Jechi touches on them. So it says, it will be correct perhaps to say that. There, there is a conflict. See on my highlighted screen now, or sharp disagreement on how they interpret reality. Others say, no, 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 no perhaps religion is more subjective. So see the dialogue, the four points I made from Babo, a professor of physics and religion. Mm -hmm. That's page 187 of the text. You see it on slide number seven. What does it say? Conflict, this. That's what I'm touching on now. Very good. 
conflict, independence, dialogue, and what? Integration. Various theses, four ways of thinking of what? The possible relation, science and religion interact, how they interact. Conflicting, independent, dialoguing, or integrating. Okay, so the subsequent, watch, we're almost done with the text. The subsequent paragraphs here, what you see, I'm going to take each one of them. And the chief tries to do a good job on that. For a philosopher, that was a human's job. With a lot of science. So there, this is now the conflict view of science and religion. Read it and see what it says. This is the next paragraph you see now is the independence thesis view, that they are independent of each other. Okay? That's the two are parallel conceptual schemes, like I was saying. Read it. I'll ask you your your term paper will be around this. Sorry, that I've told you now. Okay. The third one, that they, they are in dialogue. Science and religion are chatting. So this one says it, then the other person says his own. Then they converse. And then there's something I bring to the discussion that you don't bring. So we are not conflicting and we are not totally independent of each other either. But we are in dialogue. Others think, no, 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 it's more than that. That they are actually an integrated view. They are a married couple of a kind. See how Jesse now develops the last point, which is what? That science and religion are integrated. He argues from natural theology and design. There again, he will show you certain scientific folks that make a case for religion, showing the integration of the two. Okay, Newton is mentioned heavily. The other fine scientists that we know are there. The names are there for you to find, okay? Then there is orderliness. The fact that the, I told you the tree gives us carbon dioxide and takes our oxygen. So what the tree doesn't like, we welcome wholesale. And what we don't like, the trees take. That is order, design, regularity. That helps to predict and so on and so forth. There is a certain conversation, integration, design. So you remember the argument from design and others that we've done very well, okay? Einstein is there. We saw Newton. These are brand names in scientific enterprise, yet they are connected somewhat with what? Science as what? Integrated with religion, not conflicting with it, not necessarily independent of each other, not even just in dialogue, but integrated. There comes the second argumentation, quantum physics and religion. There's so much to say there. The whole point is to tell you that there is some sense in which you would say science and religion are, are doing one thing. They are integrated, almost fra fra, sort of. Eh? If indeed God goes, look at that. So chance, and here there's a mention of the account thinkers. That's why I highlighted that. Okay, that what you say happened by chance could be already preordained by the one who knows the antecedents of all this. Why did the tree, that particular tree, fall down at that particular time when that particular brother passed that particular place at that particular time? <laughs> That's the one that will make the typical accountant who is heavily religious say that, ah, this one there, this one there. And you're <laughs> Why is it that plenty of people pass that place at that time? The tree didn't fall down. It's a natural thing. The, uh, the scientists will see. But the accountant will say, no, no, no. It is no chance that oh, it happened that the trees, whatever, uh, the, 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 the back of the tree became weak. And so it, no, 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 no. It's no chance. It says this one, there has to be a cause unexplained. So Jeti makes a case like that here and says, I can't think as, as Aristotle. Eh? So he's, he's comparing that to to Aristotle, so that you don't think is that I can't people that have done anything. Africans, yeah, there's no. He says a chance event, the event we call chance, coincidence, if you like, as such, would in fact be an event whose cause is unknown, not one that lacks a cause and occurred randomly. No, you can't say it just happened. He says we just don't have an explanation. So this can be an example. I can quote this and, and give you a compulsory exam question from here for you to think and reflect. All this coming from Jechi. <clears throat> you almost done, eh? 
I take some few minutes of your time and wrap up nicely. I do not claim to comprehend the details. That's just you talking now. But I believe that this principle, what principle is that there's a certain principle can work for what? The relationship between religion and science. What is that? What is that principle? That they are complementary. Look, this one. I've said complementary more than, if you play back, you can count how many times I said complementary. It should tell you that I may ask you a question on that. Boss view that there can be two complementary descriptions of the same reality. The God that answers by fire can also be the God that answers with a still small voice, uh, describing the same God. These two complement each other. The lion of the tribe of Judah is also the lamp that was slain. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And yet he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. These two are not in conflict. These two views, for example, of the Christian Christ, is not in conflict. It's describing different aspects of one, one entity. And those two views complement each other for you to have a correct understanding of the being, the person that you call Christ. That's an example I've given. If you look at my deep, you see I put there. The lion is also a lamp. Those of us who are like him, you can see the lion in us. In the next minute, we are calmly sitting down. The sheep in us has come. Why? Because we are trying to live by his nature. That's an example, complementary. Religion and science then, according to Jechi, could play that role. There we go. Evolution and creation. This is where I tell you Jechi critiques Darwin. He uses his own quotation. See on my screen, that's the quote. I, I Darwin, this Darwin speaking, I'm inclined to look at everything as resulting from designed laws with the details, whether good or bad, left to the working out of what we may call chance. I cannot think that the world as we see it is the result of chance. The same person who says, I think everything may result from chance, yet I don't think everything that we see results from chance. Yet I cannot look at each separate thing as a result. So just says, look at the way the, the gentleman is confused. There's confusion. See, it is not clear, this is it, whether he fully supports design or fully supports chance. This is Jetty. Read it further, take note of the page, and see what Jetty makes of the evolutionary theory of Darwin, which seeks to critique the, the claim that there is ultimate design. There is ultimate brain behind the world and the organized <clears throat> uh, creation that we see. Okay, you have to see. And it's not the, the fact that Jechi is because Jechi is saying Jechi, 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 but the, the wisdom in what is being projected is what I'm drawing attention to. Okay, we have three slides to go, or three points that I've made to go. Okay, so evolution and human nature is what is on your screen now. Then we'll move on to. Read all of that, you get some the conception of man as a unity. What was the earlier one here? Very good. The relationship between science and religion in Islam. There's a touch on Islam because Islam will not permit you to have different versions of, say, creation story. You know, it, it doesn't allow that extreme way of looking at different. No, 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 no. So the, and it integrates the scientific method in it, according to Jechi. So you won't have too many of the contentions that you would normally have around Christianity, it's the silence, sort of. So there is the summary of the whole text. You can't complain. I was so much, it was beautifully written, summarized paragraph by paragraph, pointers to help you see what has been said in the whole text. And then a good conclusion that tells you what I have tried to help you see, even in our discussion, that the two may not necessarily be against each other, but they may not necessarily also be saying the same thing they may only be complementing each other. Thank you so much. Any questions? Okay, then I think that we are so good on that and we will be able to move on to a third team in our course. So we, we don't have to. Everything I've said is in my, my look on my screen now, you see the points I used to guide you through the Jechi text. You will see that almost everything there 
is self-explanatory. Some of them are questions I asked to guide your reading. Why would the dialogue view seem to have some more value than the independence thesis view? I can't think guess like Aristotle says so and so and so and so. Do you agree? Ball's principle of complementarity, two sides needing each other to blah, blah, blah. This say religion and science are different aspects of diff or different languages that ultimately express the same reality. Think about that. How does the Chi engage the Darwin a view and your view of the evolutionary theory and its critique, blah, blah, blah. Always think of an Africanization, if you like, a contextualization of those views so that it will make a lot of meaning to everyone. I think we can now move on to the next topic or the next theme on environment, climate change, etc., which is also quite heavy. If there is no question, we welcomed a, a guest from, I, I think I got a notification. I don't know if our guest is still with us. Just want to mention him. So I got a, prom, a prompt from Prof. J that we're going to have um, a visitor. Where is Prof. J? Just a minute. Let's give up. Uh, yeah. So from NYU, a postdoc. That is from NYU. I don't know if you are there and you want to say hi. We just want to acknowledge that you were here. We, we, we are glad to have had you through to the end. If you are still in there, if you would kindly just unmute and say hi, and then we are done. Okay. Maybe our guests couldn't stay through to the end, or, or better still, maybe he couldn't come in at all. Thank you, all, everyone. Have a wonderful week. We'll continue with our discussion. Look out for notice on our platform and then also on Sakai. If there is any information, I'll put it there. Thank you, Gracious. <laughs> Thank you for the reaction. I enjoyed that. All the best, everyone. And take care. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. <laughs>